Hey, 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 it's your friendly pharmacist back for our first full episode of Hail's Facts. Welcome to my podcast, people. I am sure y'all had better things to do today, but I am so happy that y'all decided to spend time with me today. (laughs) I don't know about you guys, but I am so excited to be sitting here on my bed. Well, on my chair this time. I'm sharing my knowledge with you guys, you know. So let's not waste any more time. Let's go. So I spent the last couple of weeks racking my brain about what to talk about for my first podcast. Then I went on Facebook. Lo and behold, like my mom would say, between shout out to my mom and dad, my only two subscribers. Thank you. Love you guys. Anyway, my answer was right there. The last few months, I have been administering COVID vaccines, got vaccinated myself. Yeah, holla. (laughs) And, you know, shout out to my fellow lab rats who got vaccinated as well. (laughs) Let's stay on topic here. Okay. I've heard many opinions, questions, and concerns about these vaccines, so I think we can all agree that it deserves the first spot on my podcast. So here we go. Okay, right now, there are three different brands of COVID-19 vaccines authorized for emergency use in the United States. Now, I thought I should probably take a moment here to explain what that means. Emergency use Authorization, also known as EUA, as defined by the FDA, is a mechanism to facilitate the availability and the use of vaccines during public health emergencies. Okay, in big words. But anyways, in this case of COVID-19 vaccines, they are not FDA approved like you guys already know. However, they have been given an EUA, which means they have been thoroughly reviewed and found to be safe and efficacious. Ooh, that word. (sighs) Okay, I probably should define it because you know what? I didn't know exactly what it meant either, but efficacious means successful in producing a desired result, as opposed to effective, which sometimes gets confused with it. Effective, on the other hand, is the degree to which something is successful in producing a desired result. As you can tell, I got that definition on Google. Thank you. Thank you, Google. All right. So that basically means that that question of effectiveness has not been fully answered yet. All right. So FDA gave EUA to these vaccines after ensuring that certain criteria have been met. So let me list out this criteria to you because I know a lot of people have been kind of confused on this. All right. So one the presence of a serious life-threatening disease or condition. Two, evidence of effectiveness. I repeat, evidence of effectiveness. Three, benefits outweigh the risk. So that means benefits outweigh the risk, okay. And four, no alternatives. All right, y'all probably already figured that part out. So the vaccines in question include Pfizer, BioNTech, COVID-19 vaccine, that's a full name. I probably won't say that again. Moderna, N-I-A-I-D, vaccine. And the last one, J&J, Johnson & Johnson by Janssen, COVID-19 vaccine. I don't know, that is just a whole mouthful, but there we go. All right, so I thought it would be a lot easier to go through a Q&A session instead of spitting out some fact to you guys. So um, there are a lot of questions to go over precisely 21. So I may have to make this a two-part episode. We shall see. I got most of my information from the New England Journal of Medicine, NEJM, and the CDC website. Pretty legit. So um, if you want to, their websites are also available for your viewing. So if you have trust issues, feel free to fact check me. All right. All right. Okay. That being said, let's get to it. (laughs) All right. I am going to stop messing around. I'm going to get serious for a second here. All right, everybody, let's take a moment here to give credit where credit is due. If you haven't heard about Anchor before, you're hearing it from me now, all right? It's a creation app that allows you to record, edit your podcast right from your phone or your computer. 
it will distribute your podcast for you so you can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. It is free. What did I say? Yes. Yes, I said it's free. You can make money from your podcast as well. So what are you waiting for? Go and download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Let's go. All right. (laughs) That was my British accent. Question number one. How do mRNA COVID-19 vaccines work? All right. Pfizer and Moderna. I'm sure you guys have heard of them before. If you haven't, crack open a newspaper, will ya? If that's a thing, I don't know. Both of them are mRNA vaccine. M standing for messenger. Messenger RNA vaccines. For those of you who did not take biology in college, that's what it is. All right. So this means that they contain material from the virus that tells our cells to create spike proteins. Y'all probably heard of that because I feel like I keep hearing spike protein, spike protein, spike proteins. So this protein is then targeted by our immune system. And shortly after, that mRNA is destroyed by our body, which means it doesn't stay for very long. It's gone, gone, disappeared, does not enter our nucleus where our DNA lives. Therefore, it shall not attach to our DNA. So sorry to disappoint you guys, you know, but no genetic mutations, all right? So antibodies will be created to target spike proteins. The spike proteins that I mentioned before, ergo, our body can now fight the virus if we were ever to become exposed to it. Come friend day, okay. An interesting fact though for you guys is that um, these may be the first mRNA vaccines to be in humans, but scientists have actually been working on this for a very long time. So stop with the conspiracy theories, okay? It's been here for a while. Y'all just never heard of it. All right, question number two. How do viral vector COVID-19 vaccines such as J&J vaccine work? Okay, here we go. A viral vector, basically, is a modified version of a virus that is not the COVID-19 virus, okay? So, this modified virus has material from the COVID-19 virus. However, it cannot reproduce inside your body. It's just basically the cab driver bringing a code of spike protein in. This code, however, will have to enter the cell's nucleus so that it can be converted to an mRNA. You remember when I said mRNA, messenger RNA? Okay. Our cells then make copies of this protein, and then these proteins are targeted by our immune system, which will create antibodies that will prevent future COVID-19 infections. So don't worry, there will be no genetic mutations in this case either. All right? Sorry. So I just want to mention real quick, so I was talking to my sister the other day about this podcast topic, and she asked me, you know what, can you explain the vaccines to me? Which I said, all right, I'll do that. So five seconds in, she stopped me. And she was like, I have no idea what you just said. Sounds like a bunch of scientific gibberish, which kind of sucks, you know, because the whole point of my podcast is to not use all that stuff. So I am sure you guys are probably feeling the same way hearing all this. So I thought maybe I'd try to find a better way to explain this to you. So here we go. Science community, please don't judge me. Okay. Think of the vaccine as the mailman dropping off the birthday present that you ordered for your kid not usps though we all know usps we can identify them from a mile away so that wouldn't work it will spoil the surprise so we have to go incognito so it has to be someone they won't recognize let's say dhl right dhl okay let's do that so dhl drops out the box and you open it Ooh, it's a recipe containing a book of instructions to bake the best German chocolate cake. German chocolate, okay. So this recipe book is what they call the viral vector. I'm very good with analogies, so just hear me out here. But it's in German. It's in German. We don't speak German. So we have to grab our translator, which is our, you know, grab a computer with the translator and translate this recipe to English. So our computer in this case is going to be the nucleus, all right? Okay, so the English version of this recipe will be the messenger RNA. Man, I'm so smart, I know. 
just just keep, just wait. I, I'll keep going here. All right. The mRNA, mRNA whew, is nothing but the instructions. All right. So it's not good for anything else. Just to tell a story. Okay. So does this make any sense to you? If it doesn't, I'm sorry. I'm going to keep going. You are still going to need supplies from your kitchen, your own ingredients to whip up this cake. So you follow the recipe, you bake the most perfect, perfect German cake. And then you decide to leave it out to cool. You go to the bathroom, do a few things. And you know, I'm just gonna mention here, the German cake is a spike protein. If y'all haven't figured it out, obviously that's what it is, all right? Then you leave it out, you know, cooling down, your kid finds it. They eat up the whole thing. <laughs> so, they start to feel really sick, right? Okay. And then they throw it all up. All that work thrown all up. Okay. So you have to clean up the mess. And that's not all. They feel crappy and they throw up every time they see a German cake. <laughs> so the upside though to this is it becomes easier every time to clean up the mess because you become a pro at it. All right. You've been doing it so many times. So if you haven't figured this out already, the kid is your body's immune system, right? The immune cells, like the macrophages. I don't wanna go into details, but that's an immune cell. And you are the antibody, right? Okay, what a twist. <laughs> so I hope this analogy didn't make you even more confused, but that's the gist, that's all I gotta say. Um, if you like replay that part, it might make more sense now that you know who plays what part. I'm gonna move on. Question number three. What do we know about the mRNA vaccine's efficacy? Both mRNA vaccines are remarkably effective. They were both involved in large clinical trials that enrolled 10,000 of people, okay, a lot. And the vaccines did lower the chance of getting COVID-19 by about 95% in comparison to placebo. Placebo is basically people who did not get the vaccine, but that they did. Whew, I know, that sucks, but it's totally ethical. The point is, though, those are really good results for both vaccines. To help you understand these numbers, the flu vaccine that some of you guys get every year has only 40 to 60% efficacy. Yeah, just let that sink in for a moment there. Okay, in addition, the participant in the study were cry. They were pretty representative. They were pretty representative of the US population. I mean, all ages, all sex size, all races, and all ethnicities were included. Both vaccines were given two doses and some protection was evident just 10 to 14 days after the first dose. Now I know some of you guys are probably thinking, whew, maybe I can do away with the second dose. No, don't do that. Please don't do that, all right? The 95% efficacy came after the use of two doses, so we don't really know what's gonna happen if you do a single dose, so please don't. Okay, on to question four. How was the Johnson & Johnson vaccine studied and how efficacious was it? Okay, the J&J study actually started in September of 2020. It had about 40,000 participants and it was pretty interesting. It included people from North America, Latin America, including Brazil, lots of Brazilians actually, and then South Africa. The vaccine's efficacy, however, was about 66 to 67% in reducing the occurrence of moderate to severe COVID-19. The results are actually more impressive for prevention of severe disease, hospitalization, and death. So the vaccine did reduce the risk of severe disease by 85%, which is more, much, much higher than, you know, 66%. And then it also reduced the risk of hospitalization at day 14 or later by about 93%. And at day 28 or later by 100%, okay? So this is something to think about if you're considering this vaccine. Now, that brings me to the next question. Question five. Why should we give a viral vector vaccine when the mRNA vaccines are more effective? That's a good question. It's pretty obvious. The efficacy results from the J&J &J vaccine study are overall lower than that of the Pfizer and the Moderna. The goal of preventing though, 
the goal of preventing severe disease, hospitalization and debt was pretty impressive. You got to give him that, okay? And this also, I know this is crazy. It included the activity against variants, which I think is something that we should probably think of, especially right now, because that's like what's going around and most of the vaccines don't cover all the variants. Not to mention the fact that vaccines are not crazy accessible right now and you only need one dose for the J&J. So for some people, I think that might be a plus, you know. Question six, how long will the vaccines work? Are booster doses required? Valid question, but I do not have this information right now, sorry. <laughs> Data from phase one trial of the Moderna vaccine actually showed that antibodies lasted about four months and they kind of wane slightly over time. But, you know, apparently I've heard both both companies are actually developing vaccines that could be administered as boosters and may also cover it for the new variants. So who knows? That's something we got to keep an eye out for. And I'll let you know if anything comes out. Question seven. Do the vaccines work against the emerging variants of SARS-CoV-19? Another valid question. However, that information is not yet available. <laughs> Sorry. Although we do have to recognize though that the Johnson & Johnson vaccine study included participants in countries where most of these new variants emerged, yet still showed pretty much the same efficacy in all regions, in all countries, including South Africa and Brazil with the crazy variants, all right? So I would say this happened prior to the identification of most variants, but it's still useful. So do with that information what you may. On to the next question. Question eight. Do the vaccines prevent transmission of the virus to others? <sighs> you know, some people when exposed to the virus do not show any symptoms, but this is a really concerning question that needs to be answered. <sighs> At the initial release of the vaccines, there was no information on asymptomatic infection because we really didn't know much about the vaccines. However, However, new evidence now show that people who are vaccinated are less likely to transmit infection to others. And among those who do get infected after vaccination, their viral load appears to be much lower, meaning lower risk of transmission. So we have to be aware the vaccines do not provide 100% protections, but the evidence is in the large drop in case numbers and hospitalizations since vaccination started. We can see it every day in the numbers. The numbers are dropping. Well, except for like after spring break, but we have to consider people are crazy and do stupid things. But it has dropped drastically over the last few months. So, and the other day I have to mention, I went to donate blood and um, I asked about donating covalent plasma because that's something that they use to treat people with COVID. And um, the nurse told me, we're not really taking those right now because there's really no demand for it. And I was like, what? I mean, that's amazing news. That's great news. That means like the demand for it is lower, which means there are not as many hospitalization and critical cases of COVID-19. So we are making progress. That being said, if you're not vaccinated already, what the heck are you waiting for? Huh? Next question. Question nine. So what do we know about the vaccine's short-term safety? All right. All the vaccines available are under emergency use authorization, but they are quite safe. Okay. The first wave of vaccinations went to many frail, older people who could be more at risk for side effects. If that doesn't answer your question, I don't know what will. You have to keep in mind though that no vaccine is 100% safe, just like no medication is 100% safe, but we take it every day. All y'all people taking Xanax, that ain't safe, but y'all take it. So sometimes the benefits outweighs the risks. So let's keep that in mind. Sometimes the media tends to inflate the occurrence of all these rare events, which obviously is gonna increase fear, but these events are very uncommon. There are some common side effects, I'm not gonna lie. However, you should be aware of those, and I will tell you. The big ones are tiredness, headache, muscle pain, chills, fever, nausea, pain and redness, swelling at the injection site. Those are pretty big ones, and some of you who already got the vaccination probably already know. But these side effects are usually typically mild, and um, they only last for a couple of days. And, you know, most people tend to experience these after their second dose, 
But I personally, I'll tell you about my experience when I got vaccinated. I experienced tiredness and mild headaches, which I mean, that makes me lucky. This was after my second dose. My first dose, I got strep after, so I couldn't really tell what my side effects were. But the second dose, I had a mild headaches. I, and I pretty much slept the whole day after my vaccination, but that was it. Um, other people will tell you they had chills. Some people had like flu-like symptoms, but most of them will tell you they lasted about one or two days and then they felt fine after. So I think it's worth it. So I'm gonna move on to question number 10. What do we know about the vaccine's long-term safety? Good question. We all can agree that these vaccines were cooked up pretty fast. There have been short-term trials on the safety of the vaccines, but we have no long-term data just yet. But if history speaks for itself, which it does, long-term side effects with vaccines are quite rare. I mean, there's been a lot of like stuff about vaccines coming out, but then there's been research to show that all that stuff was wrong. So ease up, guys. We'll be okay. Go get vaccinated and join the lab rat community. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Seriously. Okay. Safety data on these vaccines are being collected as we speak. They're reported in a vaccine adverse event reporting system. I just call it VIRS because that's a lot easier. Now, that's a national early warning system that was set up to detect pos possible safety problems in any licensed vaccine. Now, this has been here for a while, so that's something that um, they are collecting data right now on the vaccine. So we will know um, what the big side effects are pretty soon. Whew. I have got a good question for you guys. This one's pretty good. Okay, question 11. Can a person with a history of allergic reaction receive a COVID-19 vaccine? Okay. Someone with a history of allergies can definitely receive the vaccines. I know, y'all, no excuses. It doesn't really matter where it's, whether it's an allergy to other vaccines or medications or to bee stings or food or pollen. However, it is safer to be observed for 30 minutes after vaccination instead of the usual 15 minutes that you get. So I would make sure to mention that when I'm getting vaccinated, all right? That being said, there have been rare cases of severe allergic reactions to the first dose of the mRNA vaccine. So that would be like the Pfizer and the Moderna. And when this occurs, the second dose should not be taken. I repeat, don't be stupid, okay? If you like almost died after getting the first dose, do not go and get the second dose, all right? Okay, but I will mention this. The CDC did say that a single dose of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine may be considered 28 days after the first dose. That almost killed you. Um, I will say that the Johnson Johnson knows they haven't been a lot of reports on allergies, so that's definitely something to try if you feel don't feel comfortable getting the first dose of, um, I guess, the second dose after almost dying. Okay, on to the next question. Question number twelve: What is V safe and should you enroll? Okay. So after getting your COVID nineteen vaccine, you have the option to enroll in V safe. This is a tool for your smartphone, and it was created by CDC. It's kind of a way to check in after you get your vaccination, so you can report side effects on there. And if you if you end up reporting severe, notable side effects, just know CDC official may call you, and they want you know they need more details, so they will call you to get more information about what happened. I think that's pretty good. They got to follow up, and you know, in admit in addition to that. Um, VSafe will also send you reminders about getting your second dose. So in case you forget, and in case you forget, your phone actually has like a calendar where you can put in your schedule. Um, yeah, you can put it on VSafe also and they will do that for you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Question number 13. Should pregnant or breastfeeding individuals be vaccinated? <clears throat> Pregnant and breastfeeding individuals were not enrolled in the original vaccine trials, unfortunately. So there's really no information on the safety yet on that. So the CDC, they advise those who are pregnant or breastfeeding to be offered vaccines and may choose to be vaccinated. So there is really, I would say theoretically, there's really no reason why these vaccines would be harmful to this population so i would say it's up to you whether or not you feel comfortable this is where you get to decide if you want to get it or not 
Ooh, I like this one. Question number 14. Should vaccination be delayed if a patient has any symptoms or is actively ill? <clears throat> I feel like I do not need to state the obvious, but here goes. Please do not get vaccinated if you have COVID. Wait until after you've recovered. And this applies to both COVID-19 and no COVID-19 related illness. If you're sick, don't get vaccinated. I'd say it's common sense, but not everyone has got that. So question 15, are there minimum or maximum ages for patients to receive vaccines? Indeed, there are. The Pfizer vaccine is authorized for individuals 16 and older, but Moderna and Johnson & Johnson are approved for individuals 18 and older. So um, that being said, it's not saying that, oh, you're going to die if you're less than 16 and you get the vaccine. It just means that's who they studied the vaccine on. So they have no evidence to show that it's effective on people younger. So they'll have to get that in order for them to say it's okay. So there are studies in, in children right now that are going on. So, But I will say no children should be getting vaccinated at this point. You hear that, Betty? Don't do it. Okay, question number 16. After people receive a COVID-19 vaccine, should there be any testing to determine whether the vaccine worked? This is a really good question. I personally did an antibody test, and this was with the intention of donating Kavals and plasma. I really wasn't doing it to find out if the vaccine worked or not. But my test came back negative twice. Kind of freaked out. But I did look, the, look it up, and you know, according to my research, the tests technically do not detect the specific protein that's used in the vaccines. And no, when I kind of described the vaccines earlier, I mentioned that it carries a portion of the viral protein. So it's not all of it. So compared to like someone who has been infected with COVID-19 where they're exposed to the entire virus, so they have all the proteins on, you know, um, expressed in the antibodies, um, they're, they are more likely to have a positive than test result for the antibodies than someone who just got vaccinated. However, I have seen cases where um, people have gotten tested for the antibody and it's come back positive um, just after being vaccinated. So it's really unclear. And sometimes, you know, some people do get COVID and don't know it. So I don't really know um, if that's the correlation, but that's definitely something that would need more research. Okay, question number 17. What are changes that are expected once you're fully vaccinated against COVID-19? So um, someone who has been vaccinated is considered protected once they are at least two weeks past their second dose. And this is applicable to um, the Pfizer and Moderna. In, in the case of Johnson & Johnson, that's one dose. So it would be two weeks after the first single dose. So CDC did give guidelines for these people. Um, so I thought I'd share it with you guys. It's up to you whether you want to follow it or not. But if you are vaccinated, here's what you can do. You can gather indoors with fully vaccinated people without wearing a mask. Woo, yay. Um, second, you can gather indoors with unvaccinated people from one other household without masks. Unless any of those people or anyone they live with has an increased risk for severe illness from COVID-19 because we don't want to be putting other people at risk, um, especially people that are immunocompromised. So I would say if you're visiting a, um, relatives who all live together, you can definitely hang out with them, but just make sure you're not putting someone that's um, at higher risk, at risk of getting COVID. So another thing is you can forego testing if you were exposed to someone who had COVID, unless you were showing symptoms. So, I mean, I would want to know. That being said, you still need to take some precaution and follow your state health mandates. Now, don't go being a care. And if they say you got to wear a mask, you'll wear a mask. Do what you got to do. Question 18. Can I get my second dose of the mRNA vaccine sooner or later than 21 or 28 days? Now, the mRNA vaccines would be the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines. So for that, according to CDC, you can take the second dose up to four days early and you can take it up to 42 days after the first dose. However, the recommended timeline is preferred. So that would be 21 days for Pfizer and 28 days for Moderna. Okay, 
On to the next question, number 19. Should a person who is exposed to COVID-19 be vaccinated in order to prevent the disease? All right, so there's no evidence to support the use of COVID-19 to prevent disease after known exposure. So if you have been exposed, you should finish your 10 day quarantine before getting vaccinated. It's not going to prevent it. You know, if you've been exposed, you've been exposed. You got to just get through it and then you can get vaccinated when you feel better. All right. So question 20, this is a question that I get a lot. So I'm excited about this one. Should someone who has recovered from COVID-19 be vaccinated? Yes, you should. All right, so it is rare to get reinfected within the first 90 days of an infection, but there's no contraindication to doing so. Plus, you get FOMO if you don't. (laughs) I'm just kidding. Um, You never know. So if, I mean, if you were treated with like the monoclonal antibodies or Covalent and plasma, I would say you need to wait the 90 days because it would affect like your ability to fight the infection if you go and get vaccinated. Um, So I would say, yeah. Wait, if you got the covalent and plasma, but if you didn't, you can go get vaccinated as long as you're feeling better. All right. And then there have been reports that people who were previously infected with COVID-19 and received the immunization with the mRNA vaccines had more pronounced antibody responses to their first dose, which kind of makes sense because they probably already have antibodies from their infection. So I thought that was pretty interesting because that means... (laughs) You know, the first dose, you get more side effects, which sucks because most people experience the side effects after their second dose. Yeah. Okay. And last but not the least, question 21. Okay. So should a person who is diagnosed with COVID-19 shortly after their first dose of the mRNA vaccine still receive the second scheduled dose? So technically, the vaccine starts to give you protective immunity 10 to 14 days after the first dose. So it is possible to develop COVID-19 shortly after the first dose if you have been exposed to it. Now, should you proceed with your second dose? Probably better to wait until you've recovered and fully served your 10-day quarantine. Then you can go ahead and get your second dose. All right. So now i'm done with the questions i'm gonna give you my two cents about the COVID 19 vaccines i know y'all didn't ask but i'm gonna give you my unsolicited advice anyway (laughs) okay i gotta start by saying this because i love to say this history does not lie it really does not okay vaccines have helped us eradicate smallpox polio in most countries and has given us control over many other infectious diseases If it weren't for science and healthcare, we would still be losing massive numbers of people to infectious diseases. So what I'm trying to say here is we would not have made it this far if it wasn't for our ancestors who trusted science. In some cases, it took a lot of convincing. And I'm sure if some people weren't burned at the stake for witchcraft, we may have moved at a faster pace. (laughs) I'm just kidding. Okay, I don't know. (laughs) But we're now at a place where we kind of have forgotten how infectious diseases ravage through populations. We're no longer afraid of it, but we should be. So I understand the position of individuals who do not trust these vaccines almost as much as I do those who do, okay? My goal here is to help educate my listeners to make well-informed decisions about the vaccines. That's all, I, that's all I'm here for, kind of. Okay, <laughs> so you have to keep in mind here that it's really not about you. Your decision to get vaccinated will protect others. People with COVID-19 are highly contagious during the early stage of their illness. And this is what a lot of people don't know. You may not be showing the symptoms, but you could be contagious and you could transmit the infection to other people. This is mostly true for younger individuals. Like I said, a lot of younger people do not show symptoms. Sometimes they have mild symptoms and they don't realize that they have COVID. So you may not feel really sick or die from it, but your parents or your grandparents might. Are you really willing to gamble on the lives of your loved ones? It's very likely that getting vaccinated will decrease the risk of transmission. I mean, I've given you the evidence. It's all there. So if you're really wanting to gamble on something, I would gamble on getting vaccinated. Evidence literally shows that the vaccine will decrease the spread of the, of the virus. So why not make the right choice? Whew, okay, 
I'm done. I'm done with my preaching. Whew. Okay, we've come to the end of this episode. Sorry, guys. I've kind of run out of things to say. But you know what? I've got to say, I had such a great time researching this topic and I feel so much more knowledgeable. I am so serious. I did not know half of the stuff I just told y'all. So I had to do a lot of research and to pull it all together. So you know what? Y'all better appreciate it. <laughs> so I really do hope you feel the same way that I do. Um, I have a great topic lined up for next week, so if you haven't subscribed already, please do subscribe so you do not miss another episode and leave a positive review or don't. (laughs) I'm just kidding. Please leave a positive review and drop a comment. Let me know how you feel about this episode and what you would like to hear about in the future episodes. Again, thank you guys so much for listening and I will see you next Wednesday.